Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our keynote event for this year's Hillsboro Reads. I'm Stephanie Chase, the director of the Hillsboro Public Library, and I'm thrilled. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. You may come to all my events. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be here to share our, uh, our 2018 Hillsboro Reads book with you, American War by Omar, Omar al Akkad. Hillsboro Reads was created as the library's contribution to Hillsboro Arts Month, but perhaps more importantly, as an opportunity for our community to come together and experience the same book at the same time. It's our hope that this shared experience brings us together to talk about topics that might otherwise be difficult and to learn together from those discussions. Omar was born in Cairo, Egypt, and grew up in Doha, Qatar, until he moved to Canada with his family. He is an award-winning journalist and author who has traveled around the world to cover many of the most important news stories of the last decade. His reporting includes dispatches from the NATO-led war in Afghanistan, the military trials at Guantanamo Bay, the Arab Spring Revolution in Egypt, and the Black Lives Matter movement in Ferguson, Missouri. I was fortunate enough to read his novel, American War, in January 2017, several months ahead of its publication. In the months following the election in November 2016, it had become clear, regardless of what side of the political aisle you're on, that our country was far more divided than we may have hoped. This novel centered on the compelling main character of Surat Chestnut and her life in a truly divided America spoke to me and of what may happen after such a great divide. The current topics we were and still are struggling with, refugee populations, climate change, ideological shifts in government, loss, opportunism, and more are here on the page for us to explore. I was also fortunate enough to see Omar in what I believe may have been his first appearance for American War at the Powells in downtown Portland, is that true? The connection between this novel and his experience as a journalist, which he spoke about then, and the understanding that everything that happens in American War has happened, not only in our lifetime, but in most cases in the course of Omar's reporting, makes this book only more timely and more important. And yet, Omar has shared in interviews that it was never really his intent to, quote, tell a story about the future or to really tell a story about America. He says, I wanted to tell a story that said the way these people on the other side of the planet react to being on the losing side of a war is not entirely different from the way you or I would react if we had the misfortune of living in a place that was on the losing end of war. I certainly never intended this as a prophecy, and if it seems that way, it's only because reality is starting to impose itself on the realm of the fictional. In that space, the reality approaching the realm of the fictional, it seems so important to have Omar here today on all days to share with us his experiences and this story. Please join me in welcoming our 2018 Hillsborough Reads author, Omar al Akkad. Hello. Um, thank you so much for coming out to this. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody at the Hillsborough Library System for your kindness. Um, this has been. This has been really, really good, and I really appreciate it. Um, the the event that uh, that Stephanie alluded to, the, the the Powell's event, which was, I think, the first bookstore event that I ever did, um, was in hindsight one of the worst ones because it set up some really unrealistic expectations on my part. Um, I happen to live in Portland, and so my wife wrangled everybody she knew, and sort of pressured them to show up. So I. I showed up to Powell's into a packed house and assumed that it would be like this for the rest of the book tour. And the next event I did in Tampa, uh, three people showed up, um, one of whom was clearly there by accident, but too embarrassed to leave. Um, and so, so yeah, Powell's, Powell's was good at the time, not so much afterwards. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. I, I was hoping uh, what I could do is just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, a little bit of my, uh, about my career as a journalist and how it influenced American War and how, how that novel came to be written. Um, and then afterwards, I'm more than happy if you have questions about the book or if you hated the book, now's the time to tell me. Or if you want me to read from a better book, just pass it up. I'm, it's, it's not beneath me um, at all. Um, so my name's Omar. I was born in Egypt. Um, I lived in Egypt until the age of five. Um, 
Egypt uh, in the mid 80s was a place that uh, economically and politically was very repressed. It's very hard to find work. Um, and uh, technically speaking, for the vast majority of my lifetime, Egypt has been under a military curfew. You're not supposed to be out at night, which if anybody has been to Cairo knows that that means nothing. Cairo doesn't start to function until nighttime. Um, but, that, but technically, there's a military curfew that's been on for 30 years. Um, and my father got sick of it. My father, who was born and raised in Egypt, my entire family's from Egypt, um, he, couldn't, he couldn't find work. Uh, the political situation was horrible. Uh, and then he heard about this place called Qatar. Uh, Qatar is um, a tiny peninsula sticking out of Saudi Arabia. Uh, at the time, population maybe 400,000, of which about 40,000 were Qatari. 90% uh, of the population was from somewhere else. Um, but the thing about Qatar is that they had recently discovered, I think, the third largest natural gas reserves in the world. And so Qatar was well on its way to becoming, pound for pound, the richest place on Earth. And they needed bodies. They needed people to do the work. And so, um, and this is still the case today. Uh, pretty well every job you can think of, if you can find a job doing the equivalent work in Qatar, you will be paid an order of magnitude more money. Um, and so my father moved there. He, he was an accountant. Um, he found a job, and then the following year, my mom and I followed him. And so I've been a migrant since the age of five. I've lived on somebody else's land since the age of five. Um, I want to give you a sense of what Qatar looks like. So this is, this is the skyline of downtown Doha. Uh, this is a recent picture. This is from, I think, a couple of years ago. Um, there's a sort of triangle-shaped building about two-thirds of the way to the right. Um, up until about 1998, if you had taken the same picture, that's the only one of those buildings that would have been there. Um, so that entire skyline came up in the last 20 years or so. Um, that, that triangle happens to be the Sheraton in Doha, which is, was the only hotel at the time, and that's where my dad worked as an accountant. And that's where I spent basically the next 11 years of my life. Um, one of the things about Qatar is that uh, at the time, uh, less so now, but at the time I was there, there were no uh, local cultural industries. Uh, a lot of the Middle East is, is, a, is a tribal culture. The, the history is oral. It's passed down through storytelling. And Qatar, like a lot of oil-rich countries, did a very bad job of um, promoting these stories or saving these stories. There's a, there's a really um, famous example of, there used to be in, in Doha, the capital city, um, an old uh, Middle Eastern souk, like the, the bazaars uh, that you see in Morocco and stuff. So there's old, very old souk. And they tore it down to build a Disney version of an old souk. So <laughs> it's sort of like um, the Venetian shops in Vegas sort of thing. But they, they tore down an old one that was the real thing to build one that now has Prada and stuff. It's, it's a strange thing. Um, Anyway, so all our culture, like everything I grew up on culturally was imported. Um, and it was more often than not imported from the US. Um, it was also heavily censored. Um, so everybody has their formative, like coming of age, teenage experience. And ours was uh, holding up copies of American magazines to the light to try and see behind the black ink that the censor had used to block things out. Um, this is a very defining experience of my childhood. Um, I was saying earlier at, at a talk we had with high school kids, um, I, I bought, uh, I managed to bring in uh, two Nirvana albums, uh, Nevermind and In Utro, and if anybody knows what those covers look like, Nevermind has a baby swimming in the pool, uh, the baby was censored out, it was a black blob swimming in a pool, and In Utro has this angel on the cover, the angel was black, it was just a, a, a black tower with wings. Um, and so from a very young age, I came to this, this notion that, that consuming culture as it is had an element of rebellion to it. It was an element of, of fighting against the man. Um, we didn't really have libraries at the time in Qatar. We had the local library in my high school, which was a couple hundred books at most. And uh, all the books on the spines had one of two dots. They either had an orange dot, which meant uh, any of the students could read it, or they had a red dot, which meant only the upper year students could read it. And immediately, I honed in on the red dot books. I would get the upper year kids to, to uh, loan them out for me. And it became apparent very quickly that even the people who were putting these dots on had not read the books. Uh, 
the only ones that got the red dot were usually the Stephen King ones because they had a skull or something on the, on the cover and that was the, the thinking behind it. So I very quickly made my way through all of Stephen King's uh, bibliography at the time. Um, the, the other thing about Qatar is that it's, uh, it's a place where you, unless you're born there, you're really not going to get citizenship. You're not gonna be able to be Qatari uh, because they wanna protect the oil wealth. And so um, if you're not Qatari, you can't own a home, you can't own a business. Uh, you're constantly on what is called a sponsorship. So the moment you arrive to work, your sponsor, so the company, usually the company that's employing you, takes your passport. And you work at their sort of discretion. And if at any point they wanna get rid of you, you're, you're done. So it's a very sort of unanchored existence. And at some point we had to decide what we were gonna do about this. And what we decided was that we were gonna to move to Canada. And so at the age of 16, that was 1998, uh, I moved to Canada. We moved at the end of August. And to give you a sense, Qatar at the end of August, average temperature about 120 degrees. Uh, we moved to Montreal. Three months later, uh, minus 40. Um, <laughs> Minus 40 Celsius is the temperature at which I no longer have to convert to Fahrenheit. It's the same thing at that point, <laughs> minus 40 in either one. Um, those were two tough years, <laughs> trying to come to terms with, with um, everything. I had not seen sidewalks before. Nobody walks in Qatar. Everybody has a car and driver, and it's too hot to walk. Uh, taxes, nobody pays taxes in Qatar. Uh, I got on a bus and tried to pay the guy with a $20 bill. I didn't understand how public transit works. There's no public transit in Qatar. Everybody has a car and drive. Um, but it was also uh, the first time that all of these doors swung wide open. Nothing was being censored anymore. I get an actual copy of Nevermind with the baby on the cover. I can get magazines that weren't censored. Um, but one of the things about growing up in Qatar is you get the sense of, of that there are the idea of making a living off of cultural work is non-existent. Uh, what you do is you become an engineer, or you become a lawyer, you become a doctor. Um, and I still had that mindset. Um, I ended up going to college for computer science. And I, um, the very first day I took, I took CISC 100. CISC 100 is the intro computer science class for people who don't have the prerequisite knowledge to take CISC 101, which is the real intro class. Um, and what they have you do is they have you um, try to program this robot out of a maze. And so you type, you know, if this, move left, if that, move that. So I work on this thing for an hour, I hit run, the robot goes in circles and crashes into a wall, and immediately I knew that computer science was not for me. Um, <laughs> and so I stopped going to class. I, uh, I basically, I was too lazy to find another major and I stopped going to class. And a few weeks after that, I discovered um, the student newspaper was hiring. They were hiring an assistant news editor. Um, and since from a very young age, the only thing I was any good at was writing, I thought, here's something I could do with my time. So I joined the student newspaper. I spent the next four years there, worked my way up to editor in chief and built enough of a portfolio that I was able to get an internship at the Globe and Mail when I graduated. The Globe and Mail is the national newspaper of Canada. Um, I came on as an intern. Uh, a few months later, they hired me on full time. Uh, I was hired on a, on a Monday in 2006, in the summer of 2006. And on the Friday of that same week, Canada had the largest terrorism arrests in the country's history. It was this thing called the Toronto 18 case. It was these 18 kids, some of them were kids, some of them were 17, 18 years old, who had all these grand plans of blowing up Parliament Hill and beheading the Prime Minister. Um, and the whole time they were being watched by, by the intelligence agencies and none of this came to fruition. They were, they, so they were arrested on that Friday. And the Globe and Mail got beat on that story. It was by far the biggest story of the year that year. And the other two major papers in Canada had A1, you know, top of the fold. And we had a tiny item on A2, you know, arrests made or something. And so the week after that, the, the following Monday, the editor in chief has an all hands on deck meeting and he's furious. Um, because at this point, the New York Times is up here, CNN is up here. It's the biggest story in the world for about a week and a half. So anyway, he has an all hands on deck. He, he calls in the 300 editorial employees of the Globe and Mail into the room. And he's looking around and he's looking for anybody who has experience with the Middle East, which is where some of these kids' parents came from. He's looking for anybody who has any experience with Islam. He's looking for brown people. And in a room of 300, he finds two of us. He finds me and he finds the theater critic. 
And so he calls us over and he says, here's what you're going to do. You two are going to go to the mosques that these kids went to and you're going to do some street reporting. You're going to talk to people. Okay, this is what I do for a living. So I go to one of the mosques. The theater critic goes to the other mosque. I come back. I'm writing my file. The theater critic comes back. He gives me his file. And it's 500 of the most beautiful words I've ever read on the acoustics in the mosque <laughs> and the color of the drapes because he's a theater critic. Um, Long story short, I spent the next two years of my life on that story. I was in the court cases, I went through the whole thing, and I got a real education on how somebody who grows up has the most pedestrian North American suburban upbringing, grows up on the outskirts of Toronto, how that kind of person can become the kind of person who's looking up detonator videos on YouTube and building bomb making equipment. Um, and the reason I bring all this up because American War is, is in large part a book about that, that radicalization. How somebody who might be fundamentally good at the beginning can be made fundamentally evil. And a lot of that was informed by the first two years I spent as a journalist. Um, the whole time I was at the Globe, one of the things I really, really wanted to do was cover uh, conflict zones. Um, and I agitated for it for a long time until the foreign editor finally said, fine, we're going to put you on the, on the Afghanistan rotation. Um, the, way, the way Afghanistan worked at the time uh, in terms of, of Canadian media is there was still a major Canadian military presence, particularly in Kandahar uh, in the south. And that meant that Canadian media still had an interest in what was happening. This is the case with all media. It's very, very localized. And so as long as there was a Canadian military presence, there was going to be a Canadian media presence. And the way ours work is that we had, we had a full-time reporter, a guy named Graham Smith, who would do eight weeks in, eight weeks out. So you'd do eight weeks in Afghanistan, and then go to Dubai and kind of decompress for eight weeks. Somebody would come in to take his place, and then he'd come back. And so I got myself on that rotation. Um, this, by the way, is, is um, that thing to the sort of far left is the media tent. Um, all the tents, all tents in wartime look like that. Um, that's an armored vehicle, and the red sign on the bottom is, I believe, in Pashto, and it's warning drivers to stay at least about 100 meters away. And it's very well understood what happens if you don't stay 100 meters away. Um, for insurance reasons, before you can send a reporter to, to a place like this, they have to do what is called hazardous environment training, which in our case meant uh, we went out to a field in Virginia and a bunch of former Special Forces guys, British Special Forces guys, simulated explosions all around us. And uh, a lot of it boiled down to, you know, when you, um, when you hear a whistling noise, drop to the ground, cover your ears, um, try to point your feet in the direction where you think the RPG is going to land, and breathe out. And the reason they want you to breathe out is because the first thing that kills when, ex when an explosion hits is what's called an overpressure wave. So basically, there's an explosion, and it pushes the air outwards. And if that air hits you, it can collapse your lungs and so on and so forth. The very first thing that kills in any explosion is an overpressure wave. It's just air moving very quickly. So this is the sort of stuff we learned for about two weeks in a farm in Virginia, and then went out here. This is the inside of the media tent. Um, if you look right here-ish, that's, um, that's a very grainy photo. <laughs> this photo, I apologize for that. Um, that's the flak vest and helmet that um, is sort of the, the compulsory gear for any reporter in this situation. Uh, the way um, body armor works is there's level one, two, and three, I think, which is for low velocity projectiles. So if you get shot with a handgun. So when people say Kevlar vests, Kevlar is for low velocity. That's if you get shot by a gun. Um, these are, are level four and five. These are for high velocity. So AKs, rifles. Um, and the difference is that instead of Kevlar, you get a ceramic plate right here. You get it front and back. And when the bullet hits the ceramic plate, it, it sticks in the ceramic plate. You probably break all of your ribs. Uh, a lung probably collapses, but you live. And so they're, they're one-time use ceramic plate vests. Um, the reason it's blue is because a lot of media try to differentiate themselves from the soldiers that they hang out with. There's this notion. It's the same reason that sometimes you see press written on the top of cars these days. They used to be written on the side of cars in war zones. Now they're written on the top because of drones. Um, 
the, it's it's uh, it's mostly a psychological thing. I don't know that wearing a blue flak vest has ever really helped anybody. Um, when I first when I first got to um, to Afghanistan, I was 25 years old. Um, I had read way too much Hemingway. Uh, I had a very romanticized vision of of the swashbuckling war correspondent. Um, and it took a very short amount of time to realize that that was all nonsense, that this entire sort of sense I had of, of the romantic nature of both war and covering war was, was just made up. Yeah, there, was no, there was no basis to it. Um, we were in Afghanistan for a few days before I decided to go to one of the forward operating bases. Um, the way it works in a place like Kandahar, there's the NATO airfield in Kandahar, which is like a small city. It's 25,000 people, shipping containers repurposed as burger. There was literally a Burger King. There was a subway, um, thousands of tents. One day we got up and they'd set up a stage in the middle of the field because the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders were coming in. It's, it's, it's a big place and it's got a lot of moving parts. The forward operating bases are out in the middle of nowhere. And they usually have, you know, 20 people maybe very poorly protected. And that means that they come under fire much, much more often than the NATO airfield. So when we showed up to the, the FOB at Masamgar, um, they had, for the previous 30 days straight, come under RPG fire. And what's fascinating about that is just in of itself, that 30 days straight, every night, somebody's firing a rocket at you, but also that at this particular forward operating base, they had these turrets, and the turrets had guns on them, and they had automatic uh, trajectory finders. What that means is if I show up on the outskirts of this base and I fire a rocket, the turret calculates the flight path of that rocket in real time, turns in the direction of where it must have come from, and fires. And this happens in a split second, which means that every single person who had fired one of these RPGs for those 30 straight nights had been killed instantly. And yet, every single following night, somebody else had volunteered to do this. They knew what was going to happen. They knew exactly how this would end. And yet, every day for 30 nights straight, they'd come and fired. Um, they'd only managed to kill one person during those 30 days. They had killed an Afghan interpreter who was taking a shower in one of the shower stalls. The shrapnel came in through the wall. Um, the weapons that they use and by they, I mean Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, the insurgency, the entire sort of amorphous thing that NATO is fighting in Afghanistan. The weapons they use are almost exclusively the stuff the Soviets left behind about 30 years earlier. These are very old, very poor weapons. And so the person firing the RPG um, never knew where it was going to hit. They're firing it in the dead of night, and they're hoping that it hits something. And 99% of the time, it just ends up in, in a corner of the field or something. Uh, and they pay with their lives for it. And so, of course, we show up, and the night we're there, we're walking back from the mess tent to, to the sleeping quarters. It's pitch black, and we hear that whistling sound. And I remember the hazardous environment training. I drop to the ground. I point my feet in some direction. I have no idea where this thing is going to land. Um, and I breathe out. And then what follows is basically just dumb luck. It landed on the other end of the, of the fob instead of landing on us. Um, and very quickly, I was given an education not only on the very arbitrary nature of war, but also the kind of cyclical absurdity of all of this. Um, you know, we have this, this sort of the, the, the overriding notion of the future is that it's this thing that we're facing, <clears throat> excuse me, and that we can see it, and that in the way we orient ourselves towards it, we can, we can shape it. And being in this kind of situation was much more of an education in, in the sort of Walter Benjamin angel of history notion of, of the future, which is that the angel is, has its back to the future and is, is hurtling backwards into the future, has no idea where it's headed, and can only see the wreckage around it and try to make sense of what's happening. And this is what this felt like. This was, a few, this was five or six years into the post 9-11 war age that we're in. We're now almost 20 years in. And I have no answer to you as to where we're going why this is happening, why almost certainly these people continue to show up on the outskirts of, of the bases and pay with their lives to fire these RPGs. I don't know. It's, it's, there's an absurdity to it that really when, when time came to, to, um, to write American War, 
was on my mind, this notion of, of futility and then the, the cyclical aspect of that futility. This is the sort of stuff I thought I would remember from my assignments. Uh, this is what a sniper rifle looks like. One day we came out of the, the media tents in the morning and the special forces guys had come back to the main base. Uh, the way you can tell the special forces guys from everybody else is that they usually have beards. Nobody else on the base had beards. But when you go outside, especially if you're a sniper, your job is essentially just to sit on a mountaintop and you just lay there for days on end. Your, your job is to be nothing, to, to sort of blend in with the scenery. Um, there's a part in American War where I talk about this idea of like, Surratt perched this with a sniper rifle and when she needs to go to the bathroom, she just goes. That's taken from these guys, that's what they do. They're just down. And then maybe once in a blue moon, the target shows up and everything aligns, you pull the trigger on one of these things. Um, this was the sort of stuff that I, that I thought would, would be the lasting impression of my time in Afghanistan. The truth is I can't tell you anything about the caliber of the bullets or what this gun is called or any of that stuff. That's not the stuff I remember. Um, this is the stuff I remember. This is what a ramp ceremony looks like. Um, when a NATO soldier is killed in Afghanistan, hundreds if not thousands of other soldiers show up to pay their respects on the tarmac. Um, so if you ever see those giant military planes where the back opens up so that the car can drive onto it, those are the kind of planes that also take the bodies home. And so on this day, I believe this was two Canadian soldiers had been killed. They had been walking uh, a patrol on a mountainside and they'd stepped on a landmine. Um, and the bodies were coming home. And so in addition to Canadian soldiers, the soldiers from all the rest of the, the NATO mission show up. Sometimes you'll see someone in civilian clothes, that'll be an ambassador or a representative from one of the embassies. And so we, the reporters who happened to be on the base that day, me and a couple of other guys, we were perched right next to the ramp, the actual ramp that you walk up into the belly of the plane. And we were taking photos and, um, and the coffin comes right past us. And we take, you know, we're taking our photos because that's what we do, right? We're, we're removed from the situation. And for a long time when I, you know, I take this photo, I look at it, and I, I think I understand for very obvious reasons why why these soldiers are in such distress. I, I should mention that this was one of those 120 degree days. There was a couple of soldiers who passed out while standing in line before, before the, the coffins came along. And I thought I understood all of the reasons that these soldiers are, are, are having a very real hard go of it, both emotionally and just physically, right? Um, I mean, the, the, these, these folks are carrying their friend. This is just like a funeral, any other funeral. These people know the person in this coffin. They were friends with them. And I thought I understood all of the reasons why this was a physically and emotionally taxing thing. And then somebody told me another detail that maybe some people here know, but I certainly didn't know at the time. One of the reasons they're having a real hard go of it, at least physically, is because this coffin is much, much heavier than it would otherwise be. Um, and the reason it's much, much heavier than it otherwise be is because it's also filled with ice. This is one of the things that you need to do when you transport a body halfway around the world. These are the little things in combat that generally don't, don't become the face of what war is. Um, but it's been almost exactly 10, 11 years since I took that photo. I will never forget that detail. I can't tell you anything about the bullets and the guns and who took what space and where the border of whatever was, but I'll never forget about the ice in the coffin. I did um, two stints in Afghanistan, uh, 2007, 2009. And in between 2008, I spent most of that year going back and forth to the other sort of major geographical point in the war on terror, which is Guantanamo Bay. Um, the reason I was down in Guantanamo Bay is because at the time there was only one Western prisoner left in Guantanamo. It was a Canadian kid named Omar Khadr. Uh, I say kid because when he was captured, he was 15 years old. Uh, there was a firefight in a compound in Afghanistan. And following the firefight, he was the only survivor of the, of the people who were held up in, in that compound. And he was accused of throwing the grenade that killed a special forces medic. Um, I think it is the case that one of the medics died and the one who survived actually saved Omar Khadr's life. The thing about charges related to war zones is that it's not like 
Law and Order or CSI. Nobody, after the fact, nobody's walking around with gloves and taking evidence and putting it in bags. That's not how any of it works. He was the only one left alive, and so the deduction was that he must have thrown the grenade. So he was put on a plane. He was shipped out to Guantanamo Bay. He was 15 years at the, at the time. He spent the next 10 years or so in Guantanamo Bay. Um, all the other Western nations managed to get their, their detainees out. Canada did not. One of the reasons Canada did not is because Canada did not try very hard. And the reason Canada did not try very hard is because Omar Khadr's father, who was Al-Qaeda's CFO, he was the money guy for, for bin Laden, um, had previously tricked the previous liberal government into going to bat for him when he was captured in Pakistan. And so he was freed at the request of the liberal government. And then it came out that he was a high-ranking member of Al-Qaeda. Um, and it made the Canadian government look really, really bad. And so they were not going to do a damn thing for his kids. Even if the guy was 15 when he was caught, they were not going to do anything about it. Um, Guantanamo Bay is, for the vast majority of its life, was a place that nobody cared about, really. It was a sleepy marine base. Um, you know, it's an area, I think, the size of Manhattan for which the US prior to the Cuban Revolution uh, signed a perpetual lease that required, the breaking of the lease required both parties to acquiesce. Uh, so the, Cuban, the new Cuban government comes in after, after the revolution. They demand that this lease be broken. The Americans say, nope. And so I think there's a famous photo somewhere, I haven't been able to find it, of Fidel Castro with just a stack of $4,000 a month checks, which is what the US pays in rent for, for Guantanamo Bay that he, he refuses to cash. Um, it's a strange, strange place. It's a really bizarre. So for, for about 100 years, it's just a marine base where every now and then they intercept a migrant boat or something. But otherwise, nothing much happens there. Then 9-11 happens. Suddenly, it is the epicenter of, of the new US approach to international law in wartime. So what that means is that all of this stuff, Camp 4, Camp 5, Camp 6, all of the infrastructure we associate with the Guantanamo Bay detention camps was built very, very quickly. And so was the legal system that was put on top of it. It all had to be done really, really quickly. It's the only place I've ever been to that can realistically be described as Kafkaesque. It is a, passage, a rite of passage that every journalist who goes to Guantanamo Bay takes a picture of this sign. <laughs> this is just a thing. Um, it's. The story I like to tell about, about the, the sort of Kafkaesque nature of, of Guantanamo Bay, Guantanamo Bay was also the place where I, I got a real education in the violence of language and the violence of bureaucracy. So we were touring around the camps. There's three major camps in Guantanamo Bay. There's Camp 4, Camp 5, Camp 6. Uh, camp 4 is a medium security prison, which means that the prisoners there, it's for the compliant, highly compliant prisoners, and that means that you get certain comfort items like um, a pen, pen that's specially designed so you can't stab anybody with it. Um, there's little arrows on the ground that point in the direction of Mecca because Muslims pray, are supposed to pray five times a day and when they do, they're supposed to face Mecca. So there's little, little arrows on the ground. There's um, eye shades. The lights never go off in this prison. And so eye shades are a huge help if you just want to sleep. Uh, you get to take classes. You get to take language classes. Uh, you have to be shackled to the floor at your desk when you take them, but you get certain classes. Um, camp five and six are super max, and that means 23, 23 and a half hours a day in isolation cells uh, with what are called um, spot checks. And so there's, there's these cells, and they're not, they're about the width of, of this table, um, about the length of this table too, actually. And there's a little slit in the, in the door. And so the prisoners are inside the cell, and there's two or three soldiers walking up and down the same corridor, and every few seconds they check in, and then they walk on and check in. So it's this horrendous experience for everybody involved, right? The prisoners are stuck in this, in this cell, the soldiers are just walking up and down, looking at the same six people over and over and over again for hours at a time. Um, there's also Camp 7, which we were not supposed to know about. It was revealed by accident. Somebody forgot to uncensor it, like somebody forgot to, to take the black marker to it. Camp 7 turned out to be where they keep the high value guys, the guys they're accusing of, of masterminding 9-11. We've never been able to see Camp 7. We have no idea what it looks like. Um, but we're touring, so we're touring Camp 4 one day, and I'm asking a question, and I ask, um, 
So why do the prisoners, and then immediately I'm stopped when I get to the word prisoner. Uh, one of the soldiers says, we don't have prisoners here, sir, we have detainees. And there's a very real distinction there. Prisoner implies a prison sentence, which is a finite thing. A detainee you can hold indefinitely. Um, and so this kind of language worked its way into the marrow of how Guantanamo Bay works. And so there's a lot of passages in American war. There's, there's a letter of a, in American war that's from a detainee in a place called Sugarloaf that's been censored. Um, and so when you look at the page, it's just black lines. That's very much based on the, on the kind of experiences I had in, in Guantanamo. The one that sticks out in my head has to do with um, a court filing that we got. So, so the courtroom in Guantanamo Bay, the new one they built, looks a lot like this room. The judge will sit here, the prosecution, the defense, everybody's with the military. The judge is the military, judge is the prosecution is from the military, the defense is with the military. Uh, sometimes there's a translator, um, but the translation services in Guantanamo are notoriously bad. At one point we were sitting around, I happen to speak Arabic, I understand Arabic. And at one point, one of the detainees is saying in his defense, I did nothing wrong, I was just bin Laden's driver. And the Arabic translator says, I did nothing wrong, I was just bin Laden's lawyer. And immediately, the two Arabic-speaking journalists in the room just look at each other and say, does that really happen? There's a number of reasons for this. Um, it's very hard to get security clearance for people who aren't in the military to come down. So when you have civilian translators, it takes forever to, to get them through. Some people just don't want to go to Guantanamo, don't want to be a part of that system. And so sometimes you end up with these kinds of situations. Anyway, the new courtroom uh, looks like this room and everybody who's supposed to be part of the trial is sitting in the room. The media is sitting behind one-way glass at the back end of the room. So if you ever see a Law & Order episode, there's the interrogation rooms and then there's the one-way glass and someone's sitting behind it, sort of like that. And we get a separate audio feed. And the audio feed is on a 10 second delay. And the reason for that is because if somebody says something that the judge deems on the spot to be classified, he can just hit the mute button. And then we just get silence. Um, this happened a lot. At one point, uh, Omar Khadr's lawyer accidentally said the name of a classified witness five times in a row because he didn't understand. In another courtroom, it would not be classified. A lot of things that happen in Guantanamo courtrooms, like hearsay evidence, uh, secret witnesses, not being uh, informed of all the evidence against you, a lot of this stuff doesn't happen in a regular civilian courtroom. So by the end of it, the judge said, I'm gonna hold you in contempt if you say this guy's name again. We'd all heard it. I mean, it was it gotten to the point of just being ludicrous. He just kept saying it. Anyway, at the end of all of these hearings, we would get uh, court motions. Whatever had been filed in court that day, we would get a version of, but not before the censor went through and, and blacked out everything that, that they didn't want us to know. So we got used to this notion of you know, uh, filing by the defense and then an entire paragraph that's blacked out except for the word the or who or something like that, right? Okay, we get used to this. At one point, we get this court filing and at the end of the court filing, there's Appendix A. And Appendix A, same thing, blacked out, blacked out, blacked out, names, places. Except Appendix A was a copy of a New York Times article that the defense lawyer had just mentioned in passing in the, in the motion and so decided to include just for the judge's convenience. So immediately all the journalists just stand up, run to their computers, go to the New York Times website, bring up this article, and you can see exactly what it is that the military didn't want you to know. And nobody along the chain of command at any point when this order was being handed down said, what are we doing here? What, what is the point of this? Why are we censoring something that's publicly available on the most popular newspaper in the world? But that's the kind of place it is because everything was happening so, so quickly. Um, and I, I, I shaped a lot of, of American war on, on the consequences of this sort of thing. When you build a legal system overnight, when you build a detention system overnight, what happens? The genesis story for American War, the one I always come back to, is a vague recollection I have from more than 10 years ago now of watching this interview. I was watching, uh, I don't remember if it was on CNN or one of the other news networks, but it was an interview with a foreign affairs expert, you know, one of these talking heads that they bring in periodically to explain the world. And the interview was taking place in the immediate aftermath of a set of protests in Afghanistan. Villagers were protesting against the US military presence there. And um, the question that was put to this gentleman was something like, why do they hate us so much? And as part of his answer, he noted that sometimes the special forces have to go into these villages and conduct nighttime raids looking for insurgents. And that when they do this, they'll often ransack the houses or hold women and children at gunpoint. 
And then he helpfully added, uh, and you know, in Afghan culture, that sort of thing is considered very offensive. I thought, you know, name me one culture on earth that wouldn't consider this sort of thing offensive. And that's when I first had this notion of, of taking the conflicts that have defined the world in my lifetime. And these, these are conflicts in which US involvement has either been indirect or from a great distance, and recasting them as elements of something close to home. And I couldn't think of anything closer to home than a civil war where you're fighting yourself. The point of this being to propose the notion that there is no such thing as an exotic form of suffering. That these people all the way over there are not behaving in some fundamentally foreign way. That any of us subjected to injustice, subjected to violence, subjected to damage, are liable to react the same way. Uh, and that includes, in some cases, becoming wrathful, or becoming vengeful, or becoming evil. And so a lot of American War, I don't think of it particularly as a book about America. Um, I think of it as a book about the universal nature of revenge. Um, and if I'd written it 100 years earlier, I probably would have called it British War. It had to be at the heart of the superpower. Um, and a lot of that is sort of influenced by, by the things I saw during these assignments. Um, for a while, I'd started writing the book in around 2014. I started in the summer of 2014, and I finished almost exactly a year later. I finished the first draft in the summer of 2015. For a while, I'd started putting the book together, um, and I knew what was going to happen. What I didn't know was where I wanted to start the book. And then I got, I finally got the Globe. For the last four years of my time at the Globe, I was a US-based correspondent, so I was covering the US for a non-US audience. And um, for months, I had been pitching a story on southern Louisiana. Um, this, is, this is a levy, um, also a really bad photo, I'm sorry. Um, this is a levee by the side of the Mississippi. A lot of the levees by the side of the Mississippi look like this in southern Louisiana. You have this sort of sloping edge, and then as a sort of um, urban beautification initiative, they put bike paths over the top, um, which is actually really pleasant if you ever get a chance to ride up and down. If you ever get a chance to go to southern Louisiana, it is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Culturally, geographically, it's, it's stunning. Some of the most fragile ecosystems in America and some of the most fragile cultures in America, the last remnants of them are in southern Louisiana. Um, southern Louisiana is also disappearing at the rate of a football field of land every hour. Um, whenever I say that, somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, oh, you screwed up, you said a football field of land every hour. No, that's the rate at which southern Louisiana is disappearing, uh, melting into the Gulf of Mexico. The reason this is happening is there's a variety of reasons. One of them is just sea level rise, climate change. Um, the salt water intrudes. It goes into the fresh water. It kills the root systems of the plants that are holding the land together, making the land more brittle. Um, there's hundreds of miles of oil and gas pipelines all through uh, that part of the, of the state, um, some of which were laid down so long ago that nobody knows where they are anymore. And so you can't clean them up. They're just sort of leaking and, and sitting around there. Um, under normal circumstances, the Mississippi River would, would combat this. Uh, left to its own devices, the Mississippi River is a bit of a sidewinder. Over thousands of years, it would move back and forth, east and west. And where it moves, it deposits uh, sediment. And so it would help combat some of this. But in order to keep cities like New Orleans from drowning, the Army Corps of Engineers has basically just levied the river in place. So now the river doesn't move anymore. So this, this sort of... Uh, human decision to try and save one part of the, 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 the state has resulted in a sort of calamity for the other. Um, and so when you're driving up and down southernmost Louisiana, you see a lot of signs like this. There's lawyers making money off of the oil spill and that kind of thing. Um, this is what a high school looks like in southernmost Louisiana. Uh, virtually every structure is built on essentially stilts. Uh, especially if you're in, if you ever look at, the, at a map of southern Louisiana, um, the official map looks like a boot, sort of a block of land that goes this way and then a block of land that goes this way. That's not how it really is. When you get down to the southern edge, it looks like little peninsulas of shredded land. And lots of that area is undefinable as either land or water. It's this kind of marsh that's, that's sort of moving back and forth. Um, and, and geologists, geographers, people who study this sort of thing are familiar with that kind of interface. Uh, marshland is one of the things 
that really would keep, that would, that would do, make a huge difference in, in any country's preparedness against rising sea levels and stronger storms. So they're used to this idea of not quite land, not quite water. But there are some real legal implications as to whether something is defined as water or land. And it has to do with who owns the resources underneath this. So if it's, if it's land, uh, I believe it's whoever owns the land. If it's water, it's the state, you know, that sort of thing. And so they have to make these very binary designations. The truth is, uh, most of it is just disappearing. It's just going away. And so this, for example, was taken uh, at, the, at the southern edge of one of these little peninsulas of land. What the state is doing in, in many of these places is building these giant levees east-west across these north-south stretches. But they build them high up to protect the places that they think they can protect. And the unsaid message to everybody who lives south of that point is, we can't save you, right? This is what we think we can save. Everything north of here is what we think we can save. So a lot of these places, including all of this, um, the state has, has effectively de facto given up on. They don't think it's going, it's savable. Uh, this road where I took this picture uh, floods at high tide. You can't use it. Um, the GPS thought I was in the water. It's, it's, it's an unmappable space. And as soon as I got to Louisiana was when I realized that this is where the novel had to start. This is a novel that's so concerned with things America has done to the world and in the world should be, should be started in a place where the world was doing something to America. Um, and once that showed up, the rest of American war, the structure came together and the writing became much more, um, much more fluid. Um, I started the book in the summer of 20, uh, 2014. I finished the first draft in the summer of 2015, almost exactly a year later. Three weeks after that, Donald Trump announced he was running for president. And the end result is that this book, this book gets bought. It comes out um, four months into the Trump presidency. Uh, which regardless of how you feel about the Trump presidency, uh, means that it's been read in a very different way than what I intended. This book I intended to take place in an allegorical America. This book I intended to tell a different kind of story overlaid on an analogous America has suddenly been taken as an attempt at prophecy. And I constantly, the question I get in this country more often than any other is, how likely do you think this, the civil war in the book is to really happening? Is this how you think a civil war might break out again? Is this our future? And by definition, I can't tell you if this is anybody's future. Um, I can tell you that it's all based on somebody's present. Um, and if I, if I can leave you with something, I hope that it is, that my thinking about American war was that it's a defense of empathy and that it's a defense of a notion that you not only can, but are obligated to understand why somebody does something, in particular something evil, and that taking the time to understand why doesn't put you on their side. Um, overwhelmingly, American War is the story of one person, it's the story of Surratt Chestnut and her radicalization. And by the end of the book, I don't want you to like Surratt, I don't want you to apologize for her, I simply want you to understand how she gets to be where the, pla the place where she ends up. Um, the whole Trump era, is this our future second civil war thing, has been great for book sales. Uh, don't get me wrong, and I'm grateful for that. Um, but it's, it's not at all the kind of book I intended. Um, and with that, I have been talking at you for a solid 45 minutes. I'm more than happy to take questions or comments or anything, anything you might have. Oh yeah, there's microphones on either end. So bonus points to whoever breaks the ice. The first person's always really <laughs> nervous. Too. Yeah. Oh. Oh, she's she's working her way over. <laughs> Who's gonna go first? Sure. Okay. So um, this is something I I'd, I'd thought about. I get why she's brown, but why does she have to be really big and a lesbian? And it's like you, you really heaped on her. Yeah, no, no, no. I appreciate the question. Thank you for that. Um, one of the things, and this is a failing of mine as a writer, um, one of the things I do is that the places I care about and the people I care about, I spend an immense time, amount of time describing. And so 
the, the version of American War that, that came out is the 12th draft of the, of the book. So it went through 12 rewrites. And, and the narrative never really changed. One of the things that changed is the editors constantly asking me to pare back the descriptions of people and places. So that's just something I do. But that's not an apolitical act, right? And that's one of the things when I was writing, I thought, well, I have the right to describe everything. But one of the, the end results of it is that from the get-go, from the first few pages of this book, you are met with a very real physical description of this female central character. And that's not an apolitical thing, and that's not something that I thought about enough going into it. The back half of the book, the, her physical presence, was how she appeared to me. And also the, 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 the function of some of the people I had seen who had been in detention in places like Guantanamo and come out. There's not much to do. You're sitting in a room, and food slides in every once in a while, and you eat it. The rec yard in Camp 5 was, I mean, the size of this block of chairs. Uh, and there's a soldier watching you the whole time, and you're there for half an hour a day if you're lucky. So physically, I believe that she would, in addition to the scars she receives from being in, in this place, would just fundamentally change. The idea of, of you know, when it, she's, she's a half black, half Mexican woman. I am not a half black, half Mexican woman, and I think a lot about whether I had any right at all to reach outside of myself and write that character. Um, and when, you know, we ask ourselves these questions more often these days, and in this country in particular, it's framed as this kind of uh, freedom of speech issue. It's not a freedom of speech issue. I was never worried about going to jail for writing this book. It's a depth of thought issue. The reason that she comes from this particular background is I wanted her to feel like me unanchored, which is to say, to not know exactly what specific set of stories constitute her roots. So she's physically isolated when you first meet her. She becomes more isolated over time. She's not quite sure where her roots are. And that's the way I feel a lot of the time. And that's the only thing we have in common, the both of us, right? Uh, I was introduced up here, and I'm always introduced as Omar Al-Akkad. That's not my name. My name is Omar Muhammad La'ed. It's unpronounceable in English. I, the, you know, and, and so that was the thinking about this idea of coming from different backgrounds. It doesn't justify the fact that I reached outside of myself and wrote about somebody who, if a, if a half black, half Mexican woman wanted to get her own story published in this particular climate, would meet an army of publishing gatekeepers who look nothing like her, right? And that's something that I had to think about more deeply than I did. Um, with respect to her sexuality, it was a very deliberate um, effort on my part to not make the character feel like the sole carrier of her identity and every aspect of her identity. By which I mean that I am a brown Muslim man living in America. I have lots of things to say about being brown. I have lots of things to say about being Muslim. I have lots of things to say about immigration and being an immigrant. I also have opinions about taxes and love and memory. And, and so with her sexuality, with Suraj's sexuality, she is who she is, she does who she does. She doesn't feel compelled to explain it to the world or anything like that. I, I think the negative space of identity is, is something that we don't focus on as much as we do, as much as we should. The privilege of being able to say as much or as little as you want about who you are. That was a very unsatisfying answer to your question. I apologize, it's a bit rambly, um, but I'm happy to take it up with you afterwards if that's it. I, I think it was, you did answer it. The other thing is, is because I was thinking of those five brothers from Utah, mm -hmm. okay? And I was fascinated by them because they were just regular people caught up into it, and I'd like to hear their story. They weren't as, as well described. They obviously weren't big characters, mm -hmm. but it was one of those things. It was like, okay, wow, she got, she got a lot heaped on her, and these poor guys <laughs> just are hangdog the whole time. So... I was interested in the, in the characterization there. And I thought you did a fine job answering it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, hello. Uh, toward the end of the book, a point is made, you win the war with bullets, but you win the peace with stories. I was wondering if there's any specific examples from history you were thinking of with that, or? Yeah, yeah the, 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 the experience I had that inspired that specific line was I was in Florida. I was doing a story on climate change in Florida. Uh, and I had a couple of days to myself, and I decided to drive up to a town just north of Atlanta. I think it's called Kennesaw. Um, and Kennesaw is unique because Kennesaw has a law in the books um, <clears throat> excuse me, requiring that every household own a gun. It's completely unconstitutional, completely symbolic. Um, but I wanted to go write about this. So anyway, I'm driving up, and when I cross the Florida-Georgia line, uh, I'm into Georgia, and I see a billboard on the side of the road, and all it says is secede. It doesn't even say visit our website or here's a contact, nothing, just <laughs> secede. And I was fascinated by that because it's the language of the losing side. 
And one of the things that happens between, when, when wars are fought between nations is that the winner gets to dismantle those stories. So uh, Germany still has incredibly tight restrictions on Nazi imagery or language or anything to do with the Third Reich. Japan, I believe, still symbolically can't have a standing army. Those were conditions imposed on the losing side of the war to destroy the stories that prompted the war. And I was really curious why that wasn't the case here, why this still remains a country where there are far more monuments to the perpetrators of slavery than to the victims of slavery. Why, when we were looking to buy a house and we couldn't afford anything in downtown Portland, we had to veto two neighborhoods on the outskirts because somebody was flying a Confederate's flag down the road. I was curious about that. And the closest thing I could come to as an answer is that it's different when you're fighting yourself. It's, re it's really different when you're fighting a foreigner and when you're fighting yourself. And so that's when I started thinking about this notion that, you know, I don't think that this is how a second civil war would, would happen because I don't think the first one has ended yet. As long as the stories survive, as long as the language survives, it's, it's a cold war. You know, the fighting's done, but the war is not over. So that's, that's where that, that line came from. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, uh, when, when this uh, keynote started, um, I had so many questions about Qatar, like, uh, like, how many examples there were of like Qatari censorship and like, uh, like, uh, it, like if like, like nobody walked in Qatar on outside at all. There was the Corniche, which was a place just for walking. It was the exercise spot, and so in the middle of the night you would go walk by the water, but it was like a destination, oh. like that's where you went to spend the evening or something. Other than that, sidewalks largely non-existent for a long time. Oh, I see. Um, Sorry, I cut you off. Please. And, and what about uh? Qatari censorship, like, are there more examples of that? Like, other than uh, Nirvana, <laughs> and other than the Nirvana baby being cut off? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a lot. Um, so so for, for two years towards the end of my stay, late 90s, mm -hmm. the internet showed up, but it was two years before they figured out how to censor the internet. Mm -hmm. And so it was incredible. It was incredible two years of just pulling up. And we were talking about this earlier, and when I say this sort of stuff, everybody thinks porn, right? No, not be like, we could look up the history of the Palestine-Israeli conflict, which was something that was forbidden. Uh, my history textbook went from page 54 to page 87. They literally pulled out the pages that discussed something that we weren't supposed to know about. Wow. Um, my mom, for a while, worked as a translator for Qatar television, and she translated, um, she did the Arabic subtitles for English programs. Uh, for a long time, we only had two programs. I remember this distinctly. We had MacGyver and America's Most Wanted. I have no idea why <laughs> they picked these two. It's just a thing. Nobody has ever committed a crime in the US and then thought, I'm going to Qatar. Like, it's never, never been useful. But she would be told in advance. She would be given the script for each episode. And she would be told in advance, don't bother with these pages because uh, there's a sex scene. So we're not going to air it. Uh, at one point, there was a scene that took place in a church. Mm -hmm. They said, well, we're not going to air that. Um, okay. When we finally got cable, same thing. So it was, it, was, it was so prevalent to the point where I just assumed this is how things worked. Oh. So, yeah. so basically, it shows like MacGyver and America's Most Wanted were localized for Qatar. <sighs> they, were, they were cut up pretty good. So um, in 1998, the movie theater opened, the first sort of English language first run movie theater in Qatar opened. And for the better part of a year straight, they played Titanic. Titanic was the biggest movie in the world. Everybody was watching. Titanic. Just like. Titanic. I went and saw Titanic like five times. Oh. <laughs> but for the longest time, I thought it was the worst edited movie of all time because it was an hour and a half long. An hour and a half. And I didn't understand. What the, <laughs> and it's because they cut minutes. it to hell, right? It was just, it had gone. Um, you know, it's, it's I, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply critical of that kind of environment. It was also not my country. So the extent to which I can be critical of, of it is from a distance. But I also happened to live there and I had to put up with this stuff. Wow. But it was, it was prevalent, it happened all the time. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh. This isn't really a question, I just wanna make a comment. This is really difficult to read. And I could only read four or five pages at a time and then put it down, that's how hard it is. Yeah, that was how it was to write. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, there's two, I mean, there's two scenes in particular that, that I had to stop. I had to stop for a few weeks. There's a scene at the end of the refugee camp, um, 
and there's a scene that's effectively a torture scene in, in, the, in the detention camp. And the, the strange thing about that is that almost everything in the book is tethered to something that happened in real life. So, you know, I didn't make up drone killings or refugee camps. The parts that hurt the most to rights are the, are the parts where I changed almost nothing. So everything that takes place in the massacre at Camp Patience is based exactly on a massacre that took place in Sabra and Shatia, which is a refugee camp in the Middle East. 36 years ago was the site of a, of a massacre, down to the lines of dialogue that were from the, the, and the, and the torture, the waterboarding scene is just how that happens. I didn't change anything about it. So the parts that hurt the most were the parts where it was pretty close to, to the way it is. Um, but yeah, it is a stone cold bummer of a book. I'm sorry, I, I'm so, I have no excuse. I, Um, I was just curious as to the role of the Virgin of Guadalupe that she very carefully took with her everywhere she went. Yeah, it's it's somewhat tied to uh, later on in the book and, and elsewhere in the book, there are people who wear uh, keys, um, uh, necklaces with the keys to their houses, even though those houses have been destroyed in wartime, um, but they keep the symbol anyway. Uh, it was this notion of, of memory and heritage and how it used to be um, having been obliterated in any real physical sense, and so carrying on only in a symbolic sense. And so as you continue the story, this statue continue getting, getting more fractures and it cracks in places and uh, it accumulates dust like nobody's business, but Surat won't let anyone touch it or clean it. Um, it was in a way sort of this notion of how do you represent your past when your past has been obliterated? Um, and that's, that's where the, the, the idea of the statue and also the necklaces with the keys and the people's photographs and all of the, the ephemera of a life. Um, that's the function they played in the book. I think we have time for one more, if anybody wants to close it up. I'll take the last one. So what do you hope, reading this book, that what's a message maybe of hope <laughs> or um, what do you hope people walk away from the book for? You have told a stone cold bummer of a book, yes. right? But I also Thanks for feel like. it, by the way, for the Hillsborough <laughs> Reads. Eh? <For> <laughs> well, I think um, the people in the book are so real. The things that happen are so real. So, what do we? What do you hope that we walk away from this book doing? I tend. I tend to think of, of fiction in, in general as being a kind of um, weaponized empathy. You, know, you grab someone and you say, look through these different pair of eyes, experience this thing that you otherwise had the privilege to ignore. And so everything I hope for in terms of the reaction to the book relates to that. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who pick up this book and see the name of the author and the synopsis of what happens and think, oh, this is, this is some guy's wish fulfillment, right? This is the like, here's a taste of your own medicine, ah, that sort of thing. And that wasn't it at all. I mean, I live in this country. My daughter was born in this country. I'm invested in this place. Um, what I wanted to get at more than anything else is this idea that we have the privilege to ignore a huge portion of suffering on this earth. And that's a really powerful privilege, right? Negative space is never, ignore, is never explored as a privilege. The things you don't have to worry about, the things you don't have to think about. And that's what this book is, right? This book is a compendium of negative space. And it says, you can safely afford to ignore all of this. Now here, read about it. Uh, and I think fiction's good for that sort of thing. Um, all that said, I do subscribe to this notion. I think it was, Borges said that, that once the book leaves the author, the author's intention does not matter in the slightest anymore. You lose control of it. And so it's been read a million different ways. And all those ways are, are as valid, if not more valid than what I intended. But empathy is what I intended. Thank you so much for your patience, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So Omar uh, will be uh, signing books in the back. We have books for uh, sale. So if you'd like to purchase a copy, please do. And then please also join me in thanking our sponsors for Hillsborough Reads. That's the Friends of the Library, the Library Foundation of Hillsborough, and Bag and Baggage. So thank you to them. Thank you.